welcome everyone to this instant reaction podcast as the Boston Celtics are NBA champions following a dominant win in game five over the Dallas Mavericks. My name is Peter Klein. Thank you very much for tuning in today. Uh, we talked at the beginning of the day about if it was repeatable what the Dallas Mavericks did in game four. And it was very apparent basically from the word go that the Boston Celtics were not going to let that happen this time around. We are going to break all of it down as this game or as this show goes on. So give me a follow on social media prime uh, at primetime Klein, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Uh, make sure if you are watching, you like this video and subscribe to the channel. And if you are listening, make sure you subscribe and leave a review. All right. So the Boston Celtics are NBA champions for a record 18th time following this dominant performance performance over the Dallas Mavericks and there are a lot of different angles that we could go at this with um and I I think the key to this game for Boston was what they were able to do defensively they just completely shut down the Dallas Mavericks and we said in the the, the preview earlier on today that it was going to need to be the perimeter defense of the Celtics not allowing Dallas to get into the paint Chris Epps Porzingis was in the game but he was obviously not at his full powers but he he was at least a big body presence in the paint aside from that there wasn't a whole lot of shot blocking out there for the Dallas or for the, the Boston Celtics so Boston needed to do something to limit the paint touches for the Dallas Mavericks and we'll get to Dallas in a little bit I do think maybe they made defending them a little bit easier but this was still an excellent Excellent defensive performance from the Boston Celtics. You could just see right away. It's 2-0. Luka off of a, a Boston miss is bringing the ball up the floor. White chases him down and gets the steal. And it was just, there was something different in the air in this game. There was a different intensity. There was, like, we, we talked at length about Boston's lack of killer instinct and their lack of putting teams away. This was not going to be that night. And I, I thought they really set that tone defensively. They were smothering Dallas. It was a blitz. And the, the pressure forced a lot of turnovers, forced a lot of bad decisions, and really just overwhelmed the Dallas Mavericks. And that allowed them offensively to basically get anything they wanted early on. They jumped out to an early lead and basically didn't let it go the entire way. There'd be a couple of stretches where Dallas would pull to within whatever, um, nine points felt like a victory, but Boston would come back and just completely shut them down. But it, it was their defense that I thought really won them this basketball game, set the tone for what they, they, they were. And I thought it was kind of a, a good reminder of what made this team so great. And we'll have a, a time later on to talk about what this team legacy wise and all of that but what made this one of the special teams in the NBA this season was not how dangerous they were offensively I do think that puts them over the top but what they're able to do defensively you have White blocking a lively shot when Dallas is still trying to get back in this game they had six different guys defending Luka at various different times Drew Holiday was tremendous um, Brown and Tatum really setting that tone as the top two players on this team coming up with strong defensive effort after strong defensive effort it was the defense that got them here, and it's the defense that has them uh, probably right now hoisting the Larry O'Brien trophy. And then on offense, um, they I think they recognized Luka's increased defensive intensity, and I do think that that was a... Um, that that was something that kind of caught them off guard in game four was how improved Luca was defensively. And so that they kind of understood like, look, we can't just go at this guy and that's going to be the, the way it works. He, like, again, he's not super lockdown guy, but it's not just going to be easy breeze by let's go, go get some points. Um, and, and I thought that they did a good job of targeting Kyrie in this game. They, 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 a couple of times they got, um, Porzingis on him and that created some easy opportunities, but they, they really went after Kyrie on the offensive side. And I, I think Joe Missoula definitely, um, like he, he's someone who I, I've critiqued. He, he has faced a lot of criticism before. Um, and even in this series, while they were winning games, I was like, you know, don't love the out of timeout stuff. One of the things that I thought he did really well throughout these playoffs was like, maybe he didn't get to them right away. But he trusted what their base offense and base defense was and then threw in adjustments as the series went along. And one of the great things about this lineup that they have offensively is that you can kind of adjust things in different ways so that like they, they can kind of beat any style, right? Like 
the the five out worked really really well in this game especially when Horford was hitting shots um they were able to get some real big strong paint touches as well and that gave them a, a few opportunities so it, it was just it was a very versatile offense and Joe Mazzula recognized okay this didn't work let's counter to this now um and I, I thought they did a, a very good job of taking advantage of that and then it was Drew Holiday early who was setting the tone with some makes it was um it, it was Derek White who was knocking some shots down from distance Tatum and Brown certainly did theirs but it was more distribution from Tatum early on he almost had a double double by halftime um his playmaking and his distribution were so key to what the Celtics were were looking to do and I, I thought while Luca's on-ball defense was improved, once they got him into kind of help actions, then it really did seem like he was lost out there. And so they wouldn't necessarily attack just Luca; they would swing it around and kind of like they we uh, kind of dialogued or, or um, not dialogued. We kind of broke down um, from Game Three, where they set things up in such a way where you're not just going at Luca, but you're now isolating Luca, and he has to make a decision. And for all of his strengths offensively defensive decision making isn't one of those and so there was a few times where they kind of caught him in some actions and he didn't really seem overly confident in what he was going to do and that created an edge for Boston in this game as well so I, I thought they really did a great job of maximizing the mismatches that they had on the offensive end and taking advantage and then the the, the big difference from this game and it's oversimplifying the sport really they were making their shots like they were getting some pretty good looks in game four, increasingly good as the game went along before it was just an ass kicking. Um, but th there were some moments in the second quarter of game four where they were getting some pretty good looks and they weren't falling. Everything was falling for them in this game. They were absolutely knocking down everything from three. And I firmly believe home court helped in a year where home court, I, I don't think was that big of a thing in the NBA. Um, Home court, I, I think, played a huge edge here in the NBA Finals with all of those shots going down for Boston and just the momentum building from a, a Celtics standpoint. And so now the questions of if you can win with Jalen and Jason, um, questions that I had, admittedly, and a lot around Jalen Brown. And I will say, I, I've said it before on my podcasts here, and I will say it again, I absolutely 100% underestimated Jalen Brown. I thought that this contract was going to be an albatross that was eventually going to cost the Boston Celtics, and I couldn't have been more wrong. Um, he was everything that they needed him to be and then some in these NBA Finals, and I loved that when they were pulling the players off when they were up by 20, um, that Joe Maz pulled the Jays off together as the, these are the two defining players of this era. And I think a lot of people were trying to make it Kobe and Shaq and, and see if there was going to be a rift. And there just hasn't been. These two guys were exceptional. And now they, they move into a, a different pantheon when, when talking about them. By just getting that one championship, it, it moves you into a different stratosphere. And Jason Tatum, I think all of that hit him with about 30 seconds to go. And uh, I watched the, the Lisa Salters interview before uh, coming in here. And you could just see like, just astonishment of what he has accomplished that he is and regardless of what kids trying to stir up he's the best player on an NBA championship team and a lot of people said he wasn't going to be able to do that so you love it for him um for Kristaps Porzingis all the shit he took in New York and Dallas as well gets kind of cast off to Washington to just be a whatever and is now the X factor of a championship team that helps push them over the top with what he was able to do offensively and then some of the defensive plays he was able to come up with in this series. He was the one that, that really gave them the spark, so you feel so happy for him. Um, Drew Holiday is now a two-time NBA champion as one of the... Like, I don't even want to call him a role player because that does, I, I think, greatly diminish what he accomplished with this group, but his versatility and again what he was able to do defensively and chipping in offensively as well really gave them such an extra dimension that was so difficult to stop this is a wonderfully constructed team Derek White um as well facilitating all of this being that key on defense with some some key blocks in there as well um but the the guy who you obviously feel the best about is Al Horford second only until now second only to Carl Malone in most games played without winning an NBA championship in the postseason in NBA history at 38 years old he now gets his and his transition from being a star type of a player with the Atlanta Hawks to 
this role now with the Boston Celtics in this go around as the, the veteran leader can still knock down some shots, can still beat guys off the dribble, which we saw tonight, and will give it everything he has defensively. How do you not get romantic about something like that and just feel so great for, um, for, for Al Horford being able to shed that one of the best players to not win a championship title um, and, and be able to call himself NBA champion. It just, it feels amazing. And I'm not like, you look behind me, you're not going to see a whole lot of pro Boston stuff on there. Um, but I mean, again, how do you not, how do you not feel happy uh, for, for Al Horford? On the Dallas side, I had said coming into this game that Boston needed to keep Dallas out of the paint. And Dallas basically said, oh, say less. They were settling for jump shots, especially early. Like, there, there wasn't even, it looked like an attempt at getting into the paint. And that was with Horford out there. Um, I, I thought that they settled for too many jump shots. They weren't falling. Luka was able to somehow manage a, a good stat line out of this, but this was not a good Luka game at all. He was forcing threes. He was really struggling from range. His passes were just a little bit off. Um, it, it just, it was a bad Luka game. It was. Um, it, it was an even worse Kyrie game. Kyrie Irving was dreadful in this game. None of his shots were going. He got a, a good look basically from the paint and bricked it. it. It was just, it was an ugly, ugly, ugly game. And I think the jeers from the Boston crowd really did affect him and really did kind of set this whole group back. Because they got some some good performances from some of the other depth guys. Um, like Green was knocking down everything. Gafford was a factor, especially when Boston went small. Gafford was a factor. Lively was all right as well. Washington, I continued to be frustrating with his, uh, frustrated, sorry, with his decision making. Um, but but he came in and was at least giving them everything he had offensively. But the two big guys just didn't have it in this one. And then defensively, they just they couldn't finish possessions. They were getting killed on the glass. And that was a big key for them in game four, the other way where they were able to come up with rebound after rebound after rebound and come away with a, um, a relatively convincing lead. There wasn't that in this game. They were getting beat to every loose ball. Um, a, a lot of possessions continued thanks to offensive rebounds from the Celtics, just making this team that's not great at defending have to defend more. And that became a problem as it went along. They just, they didn't have it tonight. Um, they, they were the more desperate team in game four, but watching this in game five, that felt like their last chance, right? Like that, that felt like it was their last big spurt to just avoid being swept. And they, they just didn't have it in this one. Um, I worry about what the criticism around Luca is going to be. Um, I, I do hope that this is maybe a bit of a sign to him that the defensive side of the ball does need to be taken care of a little bit more. Um, there's always going to be talk about his conditioning, but maybe that, that maybe that does need to be addressed a little bit more as well. Um, but th this is... This is one of the best players in the world, and he showed it all postseason long. Um, Kyrie is an interesting part of this because he did not have a good finals, but he had an excellent postseason in getting them here. And now we'll, we'll see what they do, if they, they can keep kind of this nucleus together. Um, that They got something in Lively for sure. Uh, Washington and Gafford really helped change the identity of this club. If they can get maybe a little bit more defense and a little bit more shot making, which, I mean, everyone's looking for that. But if they can get some of that, this team can be a real factor. The West is only getting more difficult. Oklahoma Oklahoma City is going to be better. Um, Denver, you have to assume, is going to be back. The San Antonio Spurs are coming, man. John Morant is coming back for, for a Memphis team that was a real threat a couple of years ago. The West is going to be really, really dangerous, but you do have to include the Dallas Mavericks in that conversation. This was not a one-off trip to the NBA Finals, I don't think. They have one of the best players in the world. Um, Jason Kidd's an okay coach. Um, it's just a matter of what do the guys around him do. But again, congratulations to the Boston Celtics. Uh, they once again sit on top of the NBA for an 18th time after a convincing win in Game 5 of the NBA Finals. My name is Peter Klein. Hope you enjoyed this instant reaction on uh, the flagship Couch Potato Diary show. Tomorrow we're going to talk more about what this all means. Um, we're, we're also going to look at some CFL stuff and some boxing in there as well. Should be a whole lot of fun. Follow me on social media at Primetime Klein. Thank you all so much for tuning in to this instant reaction show here on the Couch Potato Diary Sports Network. Thank you.